<clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. L- let me pray for us, and then you can take a seat. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for your love for us, for us here in church, and for every person right throughout the world. We pray, Lord, that people might know your love, that we might and they might. And as we think about your word today, we pray that you'd prepare us to be able to tell them, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take a seat. <clears throat> Well, most of you already know that I play cricket. Perhaps I don't play it that well, but nevertheless I play it. And I've played for a number of years now and enjoyed it very much, still enjoy it. And over the years I've learned something that is so important about it. Cricket is a game of confidence. Cricket is a game of confidence. When I bowl, there are players that just smack me all around the place because they're confident. And then there are others They don't whack me all over the place because they're uncertain. The bowling is the same, but the outcome is different. The outcome, interestingly, in my mind, is not dependent primarily on skill either, but on attitude. It's the same in batting. The bowling (coughs) may not vary too much, but confidence seems to make everything easier. And I've learned something else at the same time. Confidence isn't something that you can just imagine up. It's not something that you can manufacture. It comes from time playing, from practice and from knowing the game. Now, as we continue in our Heart for the Lost series, Kurt has given me a topic, a prepared heart, and the Bible readings this morning remind us to be active and prepared Now, there are some significant differences, of course, when it comes to the much more important idea of speaking to people about Jesus than with regard to cricket, but there is some similarity as well. Firstly, knowledge matters and so does confidence. Knowledge matters and so does confidence. And so often those two things actually go together, knowledge and confidence. So four points today. Firstly, we're going to think again about knowing our age. Then secondly, we're going to think about knowing our God. Thirdly, and because of the first two points, we we should have an expectation. And finally, we can have a building, a growing confidence in sharing our faith with those around and about us. So firstly then, knowing our age. Now, As I play cricket, more and more I'm feeling my age. But in the Christian life, it's not about how old I am in years, but about knowing our place in salvation history. Uh, In an earlier sermon, I spoke about us living in the age that the Bible calls the age of salvation. It's that period of time when after Jesus has been revealed to the world, but before he returns to wrap things up. That's where we live. And it's abundantly clear that Jesus wants his people to think in terms of that category. That age category. So in Matthew 25, we've already seen this in our reading this morning, didn't we? The bridesmaids were doing what? What were they doing? Waiting. They were waiting. Matthew 25, verse 1, Jesus said, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. They were waiting for the groom to come. And that's our age, isn't it? We know who the important one is, and we're waiting for him. Jesus is yet to turn up for the final big event. Now, I want you to have a look at, with me at verse 5, a very important verse that I don't think I've fully understood previously. So have a look at verse 5. Matthew 25, verse 5. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy. And slept. Now it has been 2,000 years since Jesus physically walked the planet, and each generation since then has said, It won't be long now till he returns. Look at the mess the world is in. Jesus will soon be returning. Now perhaps we need to understand that his patience is different from our patience. Perhaps we need to understand that his perspective is different from our perspective. We have our ideas and plans and pressure points, but we're not the bridegroom 
and it can be hard to stay awake, to stay alert, and to trust that the promise of God will be finally fulfilled according to his plan and purpose rather than our own. Now, what happened to the bridesmaids in Jesus' story? They all fell asleep, didn't they? That's the bit I probably haven't noticed before. They all fell asleep, even the ones who had made provision for the delay. I don't think we should be surprised at all if this age rolls on and on beyond our own human patience. Jesus has said as much himself. But know something else as well. The bridegroom of the story did come, didn't he? That part of the story is still ahead of us, but it is as certain as Jesus coming the first time. And the point of Jesus' story? Everyone struggled with the age, but not everyone was ready for it. Everyone was ready for the age, but not everyone Everyone struggled with the age, but not everyone was ready for it. Uh, the wise ones in the story, they had made preparations and they went in when the bride, bridegroom came. Those unprepared for his delay and arrival came after the door was shut. Too late to get ready once he has come. Well, what on earth does this have to do with evangelism and developing a heart for the lost? Two things at least. One, we need to make sure that we are ready for Jesus ourselves. And so I've got to ask the question this morning. If he came this afternoon, would you be ready for him? If it was tomorrow morning at two o'clock, would you be ready for him? We don't know when he'll return, but he will return. And we just better be ready for it when he does. And number two, the fact that the door will be shut when he comes means that now, right now, is the time for people to get ready, both those around us and those outside of these walls. Too late to get ready once he has come. Knowing that we live in the age of salvation means knowing that now is the time to get ready for Jesus when he returns. It's a truth for us and a truth for those who don't know him yet, those that we love and care for, because the consequences of being unprepared are actually huge. Now, God has given us this age that we live in. <clears throat> he gives us each day, not because he must, but because he can. Each day, each breath given with a purpose. He has a purpose for this age according to his plans and promises, but in line with his character, this age will come to an end. You can bank on it. <clears throat> What's the purpose for this age then? Well, the purpose for this age is for people to come to him in repentance and faith. As simple as that. God has been at work in this age. It's happening already. That's why you're here. And Peter writes to Christians saying this, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people. But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God has been and is at work, bringing people to repentance and faith. And that nicely brings us to our second point. We know the age that we live in, and we also need to know our God if we are to have hearts for the lost. It's the will of God that in this age people will come to repentance and faith. His plan was always to deliver Jesus as the answer to the great problem of the fall and for people to trust him in that. And here is the good news, remarkable news for us, quaking and quarrelling Christians. 
If this is God's desire and plan, then for us to be speaking about Jesus is actually right. Now that doesn't give us the right to be obnoxious about it, but we can know that if we're speaking about Jesus, even if we're getting prepared by prayer or planning, to speak about Jesus means that we are in step with the plans that God has for this age. I wonder if you understand what I'm saying. Don't we often wonder, gee, I wonder if I'm in, in line with God right now. I wonder if I'm, 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 I'm lining up with his desire for the world. Well, this is the age of salvation. And if we're working away at evangelism, we can know that we are in line with his plans. We're working away at the same goal that God has during this time in history. Uh, it's a bit academic, I know, but let me ask a couple of simple questions and you'll really see where I'm going. <clears throat> Why did God send Jesus into the world? A simple answer. Why did God send Jesus into the world? Well, let me answer from the Bible. Uh, I'm going to answer with Paul's words from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world, please finish it for me, came into the world... To save sinners. The saving of sinners matters so much to God that he sent Jesus into the world to save them. Or was this always a plan of God? Well, again, let Paul answer again from of this time from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For in him, that's in Jesus, every one of God's promises is a yes. In him, every one of God's promises is a yes. The good news of Jesus coming into the world to save sinners is the outworking of the plans and desire of God. If we know this about God, if we know what he wants and is working at, then we know what we too should want and what we should be working at. We can do this in lots of ways, and none of them are exclusive of the others. All of them provide different opportunities for us to step into line with the will and desire of God. We can and we must pray about the lost. We can give money for the purposes of reaching the lost. We can live our lives in an open and godly way, and that way promote the gospel of Jesus to the lost. We can speak, we can write, we can be consistently and regularly involved in the life of the church and in the lives of those around and about us. And in all these things, we will be, great news, we will be in line with the plan of God. In the end, it's all about Jesus, who he is and why he came. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So we know the age that we live in. That makes a difference. We know God and his plan. That makes a difference. And now point three, we should have an expectation. If this is what God wants and if this is what God is at work at right now, then we should expect to have opportunities to fit in with that. God is busy preparing for himself a people who are his very own, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Don't be surprised if he wants you as an individual to be involved in that. In fact, if we aren't somehow involved in that, then it may be that we're not actually in step with God at all as individuals or as a church. Now last week Steve spoke about the importance of prayer. This is God's work and his work ultimately. He will give the opportunities and resources that are needed to fulfil purposes that are his own. And so for us to have a prepared heart, well, prayer will count. Prayer to the one who has the plan and the power that only makes sense. Prayer for our church. Prayer for each other. Prayer that God might give us opportunities and the courage to take those opportunities. Now, I mentioned before that in cricket, confidence comes from practice. And I think we can go a little bit further here in our heart for the lost 
our prayers will help us to practice our love. They'll remind us of who it is that's really in charge, and they will, if they're all about salvation, be in step with the will of God, and he'll answer them. Further yet, if I'm expecting opportunities to come, then it only makes sense to prepare for those opportunities, to make sure that when those opportunities come, I'm ready for them. The reading from 1 Peter actually pushes us that way. It's there in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. You know the verse well. Always be ready to make your defence to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. So knowing some key who is Jesus and what did he do verses can be good preparation. Knowing or having a Bible tract can be good preparation. Knowing our own story, how we came to put our trust in Jesus. After all, you're the world expert on that. To have that worked out can be preparation, good preparation. Always be ready to make your defence to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you, says Peter. There's so much to notice in the verses around and about that. There are even some important guidelines for how we might speak. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. Being truthful, even right, is not an excuse for rudeness. And rudeness will never adorn the message of the gospel like compassion and gentleness and understanding will. There's also a reminder there of common sense and a Christian perspective in these verses. Now, who will harm you if you're eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you're blessed. Do not fear what they fear and do not be intimidated, but in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. As a Christian, knowing the plan and the power of God, it's going to be okay. But one further expectation from these verses, just to add some balance, expect resistance. Expect resistance. There will be those who would threaten us and there will be those who are threatened by the knowledge of Jesus. We know this today, don't we? The media can be all over Christians, just like it has been for the last couple of weeks. Our friends and family too. Uh, They can be resistant to what we have to say, but don't fear what they fear. Set apart Christ as Lord. Have a fear of God rather than a fear of the ways and power of people. Be prepared. And the final short point for today. Because we know the age that we live in, because we know our God, his character, his plan and activity, even his power in our lives, we can be radically confident. We can have a building confidence even as we speak out gently and respectfully about Jesus. We are in step with God as we do this, in line with his desires and plans for this age. And we know that he's not left us powerless or alone. Jesus has come and so to the Holy Spirit into our hearts And we can rest in his sovereignty over all these things. Now, many years ago, I learned this helpful description of successful evangelism. I'll share it with you too, because it does catch up so much of what we've been looking at over the last few weeks. Success in evangelism is simply this, to prayerfully share the good news of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. Let me say it again. Success in evangelism is simply this, to prayerfully share the good news of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. We can be so easily made to feel guilty about evangelism. We can be frightened about it or discouraged by our failures. But it's God's kingdom. It's God's work. It's God's responsibility. Ours is the opportunity to be equipped by him placed by him and used by him however he should choose. As we develop a heart for the lost, we need to know the age that we live in, we need to know our God and therefore to be ready, prepared and expectant to take our place in his good kingdom plans. 
So let me pray for us now. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you're at work in the world. <clears throat> As we look at our church, we know that to be true. As we look at the churches around the world, we know that to be true. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you might increase our trust and confidence in you and that you might use us to your honour and glory. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.